Okay, let me pray for us as we dive into the scripture, okay? God, as we come this morning, we come humble and hungry. You have taken us on a journey together. You are continuing to take us on a journey together. We only want to go where you take us. We don't want to go anywhere we want to go on our own strength or on our our own choosing. We want what you want, Lord. And so, God, we come humble and hungry and desperate for you. Help us each in this room to be, have, have listening ears, listening, uh, attentive hearts to, to where, you, where you're leading and where you're guiding. And God, today as we, we look at this scripture and we reflect on the journey we've had together through First Peter, God, we say thank you. Thank you for the ways that you've sustained us. Thank you for the ways that you've held us. And God, we pray today, God, take us further. We wanna go further with you. We're hungry for more. And we want your, your, your guidance, your provision, your protection on the journey ahead. So God, we're, we're, lead us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I, I'm in the stool today because I'm exhausted, just as a side note. There's, don't think anything else about it. I am just so tired after the week we've had. Um, uh, the, 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 the philosopher Rascal Flats <laughs> once proclaimed, life is a highway, we're going to ride it all night long. And uh, though I appreciate that song and and enjoy rocking out to a little rascal flats from time to time, uh, it's the sentiment that I appreciate the most. Uh, This idea that life as journey, I love that illustration, life is a journey. And specifically the Christian life, I would suggest to you, is a journey. It's a journey with God. It's a journey in community. Perhaps you've read John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, where in allegory form, he, he, he paints a picture of the Christian life as journey. And if you've ever been on a journey, I wonder if you can start seeing the parallels between the the challenges of a journey and the the, the beauty of how God works in our life. This, uh, two weeks ago, our family had the opportunity to go on a a journey to a a little amusement park in Southern California. And uh, we, we got to go with my immediate family, we got to go with my parents, we got to go with my sisters and their spouses and their kids. And, and that's, that's a lot of people, there are 16 of us on this journey. And, and if you've ever been on a, a trip like this with multiple groups, a multi, I mean, just you parents in the room here, you know what it's like to go anywhere, like go to the grocery store with a handful of kids. You know how overwhelming that can be. And so it, it, leading up to the trip, we had to plan and prepare to get to where we wanted to go. So, so we had an early morning flight out of SeaTac, so we made a decision ahead of time to stay in a hotel near Seattle and so me and my wife and our three kids, we go and stay at this little airport hotel, and then we have to wake up early the day of our flight and take this shuttle to the airport, and then, then at the airport, we have to do all the things that one does at an airport. We have to check a bag. We have to go through security, and again, you have all these, these kids, and you're trying not to lose kids along the way because if you started with three, you need to end with three. That's part of the journey, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that my youngest is seven. Even when we go into those lovely public restrooms, we no longer have to talk about, oh, don't, don't, don't touch that, don't, don't smell that, don't lick that. Don't, I mean, we're, we're not in that stage, praise the Lord. Although I'm, I'm still doubtful. If I look, if I turned away, one of them might lick something, just, just going to say. And so even once we get our little family of five through security, we meet up with more of our family. And then we have to get on the plane. And, and once we're on the plane, the cool thing is someone else is leading that part of the journey. Isn't, isn't that? Aren't we glad that somebody else is in charge? Somebody else is in leadership as we're all snug, tight into that little aircraft. And then when we arrive at our destination and at this, this little airport, then we, then we get to see the rest of our party. And now we're 16. Now all 16 of us will conquer this tiny little amusement park in Southern California. And... You know, the thing is, if you go on any kind of journey, it's, it's one thing to do it by yourself. And you can have some fun on a trip by yourself, right? But if you go with others, it can be more fun. If you go with others, you can have more memories. It can be more enjoyable. But when you go with others, it's also harder, isn't it? It's more challenging. And so, so all 16 of us every day, we had to navigate, how do you go into this place? What do you do? How are we going to do this, that, and the other? And it can be, it can be challenging, but it can be so worth it because as we're doing it together, we're making memories that we will forever remember. We'll have the rest of our lives and then somehow we have to get back, but that's not important for our illustration today. Do you know what it's like to go on a journey with others? 
Maybe you've been on a vacation. Maybe you've been on a, a, a mission trip. Maybe you've been on a field trip. I, I've got sermons after sermon I could tell about going on field trips with elementary kids, but that's a story for another day. But if you've ever been on a journey like that with other people, you know that it requires some intentionality. It requires being purposeful. It requires some, some planning, and it requires some leadership even at times too. Today, what we're going to do is as we believe that the journey of following Christ is just that. It's a journey. We're in community together. We're going places with God together. We ultimately want to get closer to him, and we ultimately want to be transformed by him. And we've got to do that, according to the scriptures, together. And where we come to in our series today through 1 Peter is some instructions that, that the author Peter gives you and I uh, about doing this together. See, this sitting thing is not going to work for me. I'm just telling you in advance, I've already won. There we go. That's better. I feel better already. I don't know what I was thinking. I had some good people praying for me today that we'd have some energy for this sermon, and guess what? I found it. In this series, First Peter, we've called this series Struggling with Hope. And, and admittedly, uh, you know, when we dove into this was the first time I've ever di- dove in so deeply into this book. We knew that, that hope, living hope, the idea that, that Christ is our hope and that Christ is alive and we can put our hope in him, we knew that that would be a big theme. We also knew that suffering and struggling would be a big theme. And we've said that, that the Apostle Peter writes this to a group of average, ordinary Christians on the outskirts of the empire, not in the big metropolis towns like the Apostle Paul would write to, but to average ordinary people like you and I in podunk towns like Ellensburg, just trying to follow Jesus and struggling in so many different ways. And so we've, we've wrestled with struggle, we've wrestled with suffering, and we've come back over and again to hope. And, and along the way, oftentimes, we've, we've seen Peter talk to us directly. But today, as we end this letter, he's going to talk to us in community. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, he wraps up all of these instructions. He's going to give some instructions to some leaders here in the first couple verse, uh, verses, and then he'll come back to all of us, okay? That's where we're going today. You with me still? It's so good to be with you today. You know, I missed... When I'm not up here, I don't get to see you as much. So that's good. Okay. Um, okay. First Peter chapter five. Do you have your Bibles with you? Do you have your Bibles with you? Now, if you, if you don't have your Bible, you can bring it next week. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the there's there's some in the chair backs in front of you. But the print is so small, you won't be able to read it. We're working on that. And if you don't want it, the print that's too small, you can also watch it on the screen. First Peter, but the key is you want to have your Bible. That's what I want you to see here. Verse 1, he says this, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So, so Peter addresses the elders in the group. Uh, the, 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 the idea is there are elders, there are people in leadership in this community, and they, uh, they, P- Peter needs to give them some instructions. And, and, and one thing I want to make sure I say before I forget about it, he, he says, fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's sufferings. This, this term witness is interesting. We know that Peter observed the suffering of Christ, but the language here is he's appealing to them as a fellow elder and as a fellow uh, who witnesses to the suffering. He's, he's talking to people who, he, he's, he's, the language he is using here is that he is one who testifies. He gives testimony about the suffering of Christ. That's what that language is. Let's talk about elders for just a moment because he's going to give elder instructions here and, and we need to talk about that. Um, elders are these uh, spiritual leaders in a church. The, you, could, you could look throughout the scripture. There's a lot of places where it talks about elders. Um, I'm going to say this. Uh, our denomination requires that we have elders. It gives very, gui- very few guidelines for exactly what that looks like. And along the way, for various reasons, uh, we as a church just kind of let the role of elder kind of slip to the wayside. I'll just say that. Now, today, we have people on our board who have the title elder. But if you look at our bylaws, our bylaws give very little instruction to say what is an elder on our board. I would say this. We think that's a problem. And and, and even coming out of the journey we just had this last week, we agreed together that in the season ahead, 
when we get done with the lead pastor transition, one of the, in, the, the important steps uh, in, in the future will be to reestablish a good, clear, biblical eldership in our church. When we get done with the lead pastor transition, that is one of the things that we're going to work on right away. Because what you'll see today is the role of elder really matters in a, in a community. And it really matters for any Christian community moving forward with Jesus. So again, I want to make sure we have that preface moving forward. Are you clear? That's kind of a little Mercer Creek behind the curtains, things we don't normally talk about. Well, now you know. Okay, good. Okay, back to our first Peter. Okay. (laughs) Who's the clapper over there? There he is. Okay. Okay, so he's he's addressing the elders first. Then he says in verse 2, to the elders, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, and then pay attention to these not but statements. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Okay, so, so right here, I would say of all the passages of, of Scripture in the New Testament that talk about elders, this is one of my favorites because it really shows us what is the job of an elder. And the elder we see here is to be a shepherd. Shepherd language, you know, is all throughout the, the Old and New Testament. God describes himself, uh, he's described as, as a good shepherd. Uh, you know, uh, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus describes himself as a shepherd and he, he's shepherding. Uh, shepherds had an important responsibility for, to care for a flock. And, and here, Peter's saying that elders are to be shepherds of God's flock, that, he's, that they are to care for them, to watch over them. And then he gives us these three not but statements. And the not but statements are intended to emphasize the point. What does it look like to care for a flock? What does it look like to shepherd them? First, we see they are not, uh, they're, they're to watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. This willingness is an importantness. It isn't, wow. This willingness is important. It's, I would suggest it's about a humility saying, okay, God, if this is what you call me to, I am willing to step into what you need me to. The, the next not but is not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Central to being one of these spiritual leaders in a, in a community, elders need to be servants first and foremost. And then the third one, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples. So three things that come out of this. There's a willingness, there's a servant's heart, a, ser- a servant action, and there's a leading by example. I would say it this way. Biblical elders are shepherds who care for a flock. They are humble servants leading by example. Does that make sense? And for our context, pulling the curtain back for a second, in our denomination, uh, the lead pastor automatically becomes an elder. So we would say that, that pastors at every level in our church need to be shepherds who are caring for a flock. They are humble servants leading by example. Following me? Okay. And, and, and think with me for just a moment. So, so these are the leaders. These are people who, are, who their job is, is to guide a community closer to Christ to become more like Christ, they really matter. Because if we're, if we're all on this journey together, we're not gonna get very far if we're all going different directions. So we need to have leaders like this who are humble servants leading by example. Keep reading, verse four. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So, so one of the things we're reminded of is, well, whose flock is it? It's Jesus's. Jesus is the chief shepherd. So even those who, who, who function in this role of, of elder, they function knowing that this flock under their care and responsibility is not theirs, it's the Lord's. And there's a, there's a, a, a greater weight and responsibility to that. And because of that, we see that they will receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. He's not talking here about a real physical crown. He's talking about a symbolic crown. It symbolizes the honor that that these these shepherds will receive. Verse five, now he goes from addressing this community that is charged with leading them forward, leading us forward closer to Jesus and becoming more like Jesus. And now he addresses everyone in this community. He says, verse five, in the same way, you who are younger, 
submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Okay, wow, there's a lot right here. Would you agree there's a lot right there? Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's some confusion. Okay, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Okay, so is it talking just about the young people? Like, is, is that who he's addressing here? That's, that, we don't believe that's what he's addressing. It's, it's just a figure of speech used to refer to everyone else. And, and he says, clothe yourselves with humility. You've seen this language of clothing yourselves other places in the, in the New Testament, haven't you? It's something that, that many of the New Testament authors will use, and it's, it's this idea of choosing to put on. There's, there's intentionality. It's not just something that happens to you. So when we talk about being humble, having humility towards one another, I want you to know we have to choose, we have to grow, we have to work towards that. It doesn't just happen. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, And we've said over and over again how important it is in this journey that you and I towards one another not only are loving each other, not only are caring for each other, have humility towards one another, right? And whenever we talk about submission, I always remind us of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, right? It says, submit to one another. Are you and I humbling ourselves before one another, and then, uh, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Have you, how many remember that we've seen this in James as well, right? James? James and 1 Peter have a lot of similarities and, and, and different authors, and yet they, rep- they, they, they both have the same idea. I wonder if perhaps it's because for Christians at this point, they needed to be regularly reminded of the importance of humility. I wonder Today, if you and I who follow Jesus need to be regularly reminded of the importance of humility. Humility is this idea of lowering ourselves, while pride is the idea of elevating myself against others, isn't it? And and here in 1 Peter and also in James, we see this dark warning, God opposes the proud. God opposes those who elevate themselves above others. And I've always been very concerned about this because I think there's very few places in the scripture where you see this idea of God literally coming against is is the idea of those of us who try to elevate ourselves above others. And yet, this this, this beautiful verse, and yet he gives grace, uh, here he's, in this translation, he shows favor to the humble. It's like as though he pours out his grace and love and mercy on those who lower themselves with others. You and I need to be very, very cautious all of our lives, regularly checking in with the Lord and with others. God, is there pride in my life? Is there pride that you want to call me out on? What is it, God, you're calling me to do to lower myself, to serve others? Because God opposes the proud. He gives grace. He pours out his favor on the humble. You know, this summer we talked a little bit about John 13. You can't talk about humility without talking about John 13 in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, uh, the apostle Paul talks about Jesus' humility, how he emptied himself, how he lowered himself, how he made himself nothing. In John chapter 13, Jesus very physically, you remember, he goes to his knees He washes the feet of his disciples in John 13, and he turns around to them and says, go and do the same. That's the picture of humility. And again, all these years after the the resurrection of Christ, Peter is reminding the Christians then, he's reminding our community today, you and I need to be a people who lower ourselves, who serve others, who don't elevate ourselves and isn't it interesting that in 1 Peter chapter 5, he tells us that the leaders of the church, these elders, these shepherds, need to be people who humbly serve and lead by example. Like, that's, that's good. That's good. But keep going. There's still some more here to 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Again, he's telling, humble yourselves. There's, there's a choice there. There's an action in there under God's mighty hand. The, the language of God's mighty hand is throughout the scriptures. But this, the beautiful imagery here is as we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, he promises that God will lift us up. 
There's something beautiful in our relationship with God when we humble ourselves. Verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We take a little detour over here into anxiety in verse 7, don't we? Anxiety is a complicated subject. Anxiety is something that that many uh, in this room struggle with uh, as a, an emotional, mental health issue. It, it's it's a reality. I, we don't want to be. We don't want to enter into anxiety casually. But I will say this: we see the topics of anxiety and worry and stress in the scriptures, and and the invitation. I would say this is the beautiful invitation here in verse seven: is to cast that anxiety to to give that to Jesus. To, to give that to the, the lover of your soul, the savior of the world, to, to throw those stresses, those anxieties on him. It's the same language that's used when they talk about throwing their cloaks on the donkey for Jesus. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And as long as you and I are stuck and crippled in a place of anxiety, we can't, <laughs> we can't live in the freedom and the life that Jesus so desperately wants us to have. So, so whether it is you need to get some real mental health uh, help on this journey, do it. Whether it is you and your small group and, and, a, and a journey through scripture need to dive into finding freedom from worry, freedom from anxiety, do it because your God cares for you. He doesn't want you to carry that burden on your own. You tracking a little bit? Okay. And I think it is kind of interesting that he calls out anxiety in a place where we're talking about moving forward with Jesus, when we're talking about humility, and we're talking about community. Your God doesn't want you to be captive to anxiety. Know that truth today. Uh, verse 8, he says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So here he now tells this community that's trying to move forward with Jesus, this community that has been struggling to be alert, to be sober of mind, that there is a very real enemy, the devil, and he is on the prowl, and he says, resist him. You know, I, I don't know how much time you spend thinking about the, the very real enemy we have, but Jesus said in John 10, 10, that the enemy, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We have a very real enemy whose number one job description is to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know that about yourself? Do you know that about our Christian community right here, this church? We have a real enemy who wants to tear everything that God is doing down. And furthermore, he is the father of lies, according to John 8, 44. So we have an adversary who wants this community, who wants this journey, he wants your life to fall apart. But here he says, be alert, have a sober mind, resist him, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same struggles. That, that we have brothers and sisters in every corner of the globe that are struggling, struggling and suffering. How many of you follow the, the Voice of the Martyrs? If you don't, check them out. I mean, uh, they have a great app and a website, and they talk about the persecution of Christians around the world. It's important that you and I know that we are not the only ones who have struggled and suffered, and we're not the only ones in history that struggle and suffer. But, Jesus, but, but Peter says here that we need to resist the enemy, stand firm against the en enemy, and I would suggest to you today that one of the primary ways we do that is in humility and unity. When you and I are down on our knees, desperate for God, serving one another, and when you and I are down on our knees, desperate for God, serving one another together, that is a kind of standing firm that the enemy cannot come against is it any wonder that one of the first places that the enemy tries to attack us is in our unity? Is it any wonder that one of the number one temptations we face is pride? Humility and unity are one of the primary ways that we will be able to resist the evil one. Side note, because we, we don't have a lot of time to talk about spiritual warfare today, if you want to dive in deeper, a, a book that we love around here is the book Spiritual Warfare by Carl Payne. Good stuff, very biblical. Okay, let's wrap it up. Verse 10, and God, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, 
will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. We're actually going to see a few more verses here, but, 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 but there's something like a, a pause, a breath of fresh air after all this, this really heavy instruction we have from 1 Peter. I, I love that statement, after you have suffered a little while. One of the things we said, I think Brenna said it really well last week, is we all will suffer and struggle on our journey of following Christ. And yet he promises that Jesus will restore us, that Jesus will make us strong and firm and steadfast. And now the final verses, verse 12, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. See, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now we're going to practice that greeting with a kiss of love. Just kidding. I was going to have Terry Kukas lead by example, but... uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I just want some, some, uh, some logistics, not logistics, whatever, some details here. He, uh, Peter ends this letter by talking about a, uh, a, a kiss of love, and he gives a blessing of peace. When Paul would end his letters, he ended with a holy kiss and offering grace. Isn't that interesting? There's a difference there. Peter says, give a kiss of love. He's talking about the purpose, not the title of what actually happened. And and, and to go on that for a bit, this community at this point, it's not like people were going around in the supermarkets like kissing each other. That's not normal. But for various reasons, the early church, the Christians would do these holy kisses, usually on the cheek or a forehead. That's kind of the basics there. But the world around them, the church around, not the church, the, the, uh, the non-believers around them, they didn't do that sort of thing So that's for what that's worth. So, so it speaks to the love and the intimacy and closeness of, uh, of the brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Peter, being Peter, he just goes to, hey, the, this, this kiss of love, he, he gets rid of the title. And where, where Paul blessed them with grace, he blesses with peace. I'm gonna receive that. Because a community on journey with Christ together, we need some peace, don't we? This is what our leaders in this church have been been striving for these last months, is that we want to grow to be a people of peace. We want to be a people who make peace together. And Peter blesses us with peace, doesn't he? That's so good. So as we look at these verses here at the end of 1 Peter, I would suggest this to you. Humility gives us the ability to move forward with God in unity. Humility gives us the ability to move forward with God in unity. I hope you understand that God wants your best. I hope you know that God wants you to grow. I hope you understand that God has so much more for you and for us as a community. He wants us to be able to move forward together, but humility is going to be the key. Humility is the key to all of this, for us to grow, for us to go forward as a community. To be a spiritual leader requires humility. To be a Christian in community requires humility. You don't need a lot of humility if you live in isolation, do you? You don't need a lot of humility as a Christian if you live in isolation. But if you live in community with anyone, Christian community especially, it requires humility. Furthermore, we also see here in in chapter 5 that humility and unity will stand as one of our greatest weapons against the enemy. So we've got to lean into this. So how do we grow in humility? How do we stay in a posture and position of humility? humility? A few things, and then i got to wrap up because I had too many announcements at the beginning. John chapter 13. Jesus showed us by demonstration that we are called to be a people who serve. We are called to be a people of radical, generous love. So so I would suggest to you to grow in humility, to be people of humility. We've got to be doing it, practicing it regularly. So today I I have two examples for us. We have a choice. We're either going to be a people who carry around a mirror or we're going to be a people. What are we? Mike? 
Wow. Okay. Is that, is that a, a notification? Is your team doing okay? It's okay. I, I just asked for one extra minute for that. Thank you. In verse 5, he said, clothe yourselves with humility. In verse 6, six he talked about humbling yourself. Why not? Why not? It's just one of those days. <laughs> Here's my suggestion. We are either people who carry around a mirror, we're people who carry around a magnifying glass. When we carry around a mirror, what are we doing? We are seeing ourselves as bigger, right? And as long as I'm focused on myself, looking at myself, making myself look better, making myself look bigger, am I going to walk, be able to walk in the type of pride we've talked about? Am I going to be able to walk in the type of humility we've talked about today? No. It's interesting. One of my favorite authors right now is Arthur Brooks. He's a social scientist and a Catholic, and, and, and he, he talks about a certain uh, a friend of his who, who was miserable. And he was, this, 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 he was a... Um, uh, kind of, a, oh gosh, I forget the phrase. Uh, he was a, a social media influencer, a fitness model. That's what it, the person was. And, and this person was miserable. You know, probably looked better than, sorry, most of us in this room. And, um, but how did that person find freedom from their misery? They spent an entire year eliminating all of the mirrors in their life. Their house had no mirrors. They got rid of the mirrors. Even they would shower in the dark because the, 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 the science, the studies tell us the more we spend focused on ourselves, the more miserable we are. So do you walk around your day carrying a mirror focused on yourself? Or do you instead choose to walk around with a magnifying glass? When you and I carry a magnifying glass, I can't see myself, I can see others. And not only do I see others, but I see others bigger than they are. That's, that's this idea of seeing the beauty and the power and the potential in every one we come in contact with. In this series, we've talked about how every human who walks on this planet is beautiful and created in the image of God and that God has so many hopes and dreams for everyone. Is your focus on yourself with the mirror or do you carry around a magnifying glass seeing the beauty and the power and potential of everyone around you looking for opportunities to serve, looking for opportunities to make other people bigger? Do you carry a magnifying glass or a mirror? Last one. Around here at Mercer Creek, we talk about intentional community and we talk about humble service. When you and I are in a, a, one of the best places we do intentional community is in a small group. The, another great place we do intentional community is in a support group. When you and I are in intentional community, you're only gonna last so long if you're self-absorbed the whole time. Because intentional community requires that other people come around you, say the truth to you, speak the truth in love, call you out. If your small group has been a little easy for a while, maybe you need to invite some people to say, hey, how can I grow? Uh, your intentional community is also an important place where you need to serve other people. Humble service. Another thing we've been talking about here at Mercer is we want to be a people who step out of our comfort zones regularly, that we're serving other people. We can do that in so many ways beyond just serving in our gifting. When Erin Chatterton gets up here and she sings on, the, on the, the, the microphone, she's serving in her gifting. But when Erin Chatterton goes and does some other kind of sacrificial service, ooh, that's hard. That's hard. So I wonder how often do you and I step out of our comfort zone and serve sacrificially? Two little opportunities that Dwayne talked about at the beginning of our service today. We've got the red kettles coming up. It's not really fun to stand out there and ring a bell, raising money for the Salvation Army, one of our important partners here in this community, and freezing, your, freezing off. You're freezing out there, right? Right? But that's one of, it's a way to stretch yourself and serve, because guess what? You're not focused on yourself. You're focused on others. And then when we, when we uh, uh, serve at the cold weather shelter, that's another way to, to do this sacrificial thing. More things I could say, but if I keep going, the children's ministry is going to be upset with me. So can I pray for us and let the worship team come up? But here, let me say this. Put, put it back on the screen. Well, who is even on the slides back there? I don't even know. Wade's doing everything up there. Say this. You don't have to say it. Humility gives us the ability to move forward with God in unity. May we be a people who are growing in our humility so that we can move forward into God's best with us in unity. Let me pray. God, we are so grateful for you, that you are gracious and kind, 
that even where we fall short and mess up and screw up, you are gracious and forgiving and patient. And God, we have seen today this picture in the scripture of a beautiful journey of moving forward. We have seen that you want to call us to more, but we are gonna need leaders who serve, leaders who are humble, leaders who lead by example. And God, we pray that you would provide those and lead us. And God, I pray that we as a community would be a people who lower ourselves, who love others, who serve others, who care for others, that the enemy would have no power against this community because we have decided to move forward on our knees, serving others in unity and love. Lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.